Welcome to All Ages Driving School Day 3 of the Teen Course. Let's get started. Alright, so in this session we'll be reviewing all 84 questions from the DPS Handbook. It's going to be on Appendix C, page 80. I'll also provide a link to our All Ages DPS Study Guide that you can use to help you get prepare for the exam. And then also at the end of this video there will be instructions on actually on how to get to where you could take the exam and turn it in. All right, so let's go ahead and do a quick review of the 84 questions from the DPS handbook. There are a few things that you're going to need. Uh, you're definitely going to need uh, a pen or a pencil. Uh, you'll also need a notebook with paper. Uh, you'll also need a copy of the Texas Driver's Handbook, which is the revised September 2017 edition. You'll need a copy of the 84 questions. And also feel free to pause at any time during this presentation to uh, copy the answers or seek further explanation. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Question number one. What is the minimum age at which you can get a Class C driver's license without either driver education or being a hardship case? Well, the answer is found on page 28. And of course, at the age of 25, you can go in there. You don't have to take any type of driver's education. But um, if you're a teen, you definitely have to take driver's ed. If you're an adult between the ages of 18 and 24, you have to take adult driver's ed. But at age 25, you could actually walk in there and take the written test and the driving test pass and get your license. Question number two, how much is the maximum fine for a first conviction of driving without a license? Now, these are this is a question that you actually may see on your uh, road rules test. So pay attention to this one. And the answer is $200. And you can find this on page 9 on table 7. Question number 3. What type of restrictions may be placed on your license? Now on table 8 from page 9, you're going to see a whole bunch of different restrictions that apply for dis different scenarios. But if you're a, a teen taking driver's ed, uh, the one that's probably going to affect you the most are these right here, A, B, and F. Uh, a, of course, stands for must wear corrective lenses. B, must have a licensed operator in the vehicle in the front seat with you that is 21 or older. And F, you must hold that learner's license at least six months. So usually the day you go get your permit, six months from that date will be the date, that'll be the soonest date in which you could actually get your provisional license as a teen. But if you're 18 years old, you can go ahead and take that uh, driving test right away after taking the, the adult class and getting your learner's license, so F wouldn't apply to you. <clears throat> here's, the, here's the table of the actual uh, restrictions, if you want to take a look at them. Question number four, in what direction should you turn your wheels when parking uphill without a curb? Uh, this is chapter seven. Uh, the answer is on page 47, and of course the answer would be turn the wheels to the right. And the reason that is is because there's no curb to stop your car with the tires, so without that curb, you're going to have to turn them to the right so in case your parking brake or your parking mechanism fails the car actually goes into the um, the portion of the uncurbed area so it doesn't go downhill and uh, cause causes damages and god knows what all right question number five what action should you take if you fail to receive the renewal notice card reminding you that your driver's license is about to expire this is from chapter one and the answer is on page 10 and ultimately, it's your responsibility. If you're an adult, the buck stops with you. Um, they do try to send you a renewal notice six weeks prior to the due date, but you know how things goes. If it gets lost in the mail or you live with somebody else and they didn't give that mail to you, ultimately, you still have to go down there and renew your license when it's due. So one of the tips I kind of give to my students is that every year on my birthday, I kind of look to see if this is the year I need to go ahead and renew my license. And uh, that way I stay on top of it. It's hard to remember to, uh, to, make an or to remember an appointment six years down the road. So it's kind of a little helpful thing that I do uh, to make sure that I'm not driving with an invalid license. <clears throat> Question number six. On a one-way street, what color is the bro broken lane marker? This is chapter five, and the answer is on page 36. Anytime you're on a one-way street, the broken lane marker is going to be a white line. So just remember those, uh, those colors. White line means going one di uh, the same direction, and a yellow line means going in opposing direction. So uh, remember that. You may see that on your test. Uh, number seven, describe the yield sign. Now, you've got to be careful. This says describe, 
Okay, so if we're talking about describe, we're actually like, what does the sign look like? Not necessarily what it means. Uh, so in this case, for describing the yield sign, and of course you see a picture there of the yield sign, it's a red and white upside down triangle with the words yield in the middle. Question number eight. What does a narrow bridge sign look like, and how should the driver react when he sees one? So I went ahead and go ahead and posted an er a narrow bridge uh, sign that you'll see. Of course, it's yellow diamond shaped. Um, and of course, uh, it's a yellow diamond shaped sign and one should slow down and proceed with caution. That's, what, that's how you should approach a narrow bridge sign. Question number nine, what is the shape of a keep right sign and how should the driver react when he sees one? All right, so there's two different types of signs that you may see that means keep right and others like that there's a median up ahead you keep right. But these are the two main ones. Uh, here's a hazard warning sign letting you know that the lanes are going in opposing directions up ahead and you should keep to the right. And then of course, uh, if you're on the freeway or a multi-lane road, uh, slow traffic keep right. So those are there to remind you to stay to the right in those circumstances. Uh, question number 10, which sign tells you to slow down because you are approaching a double curve? This is from chapter five and the answer is on page 30. And then of course I went ahead and provided a picture of what a double curve sign looks like. Don't get it confused um, with a sharp turn or a winding road or even just a basic curve sign, but double curve looks like the one provided on this slide. <clears throat> Question number 11, what does a do not pass sign mean? Well, it's very obvious. If you're in a no pass zone or you see a do not pass sign, you're not allowed to pass other vehicles in front of you. You just simply stay in the lane that you're in and maintain the within the speed limit. And the answer to this question is on page 33. Question number 12, which sign tells you to keep in the right hand lane when driving slow? Again, that goes back to the keep right sign. This is in chapter five, the answer is on page 33, and there's a picture of the actual slower traffic keep right. Stay in the right hand lane if you are driving slower than other vehicles on the road. Question number 13, what does yield right of way mean? And this is from chapter four and five. So I went ahead and, and provided a yield sign, picture of a yield sign to show you what it looks like in the description. Uh, the sign tells you that the road you're on is joining with another road ahead. You should slow down or stop if necessary so you can yield the right of way to vehicles, pedestrians or bicycles on the other road. Um, there's a lot of yield situations that you'll find in chapter four, but basically yield the right of way, what I like to tell my students is, is the right to occupy a space. Because any time two vehicles come in contact with each other, in that moment where they make contact, somebody had a right to that space and somebody didn't. And the person that didn't have the right to that space should have yielded the right of way. So basically yield means allowing others to occupy the space in which you too are trying to occupy. Question number 14. Describe the equipment required on passenger, car seat, uh, passenger cars by state law. Now this is from chapter two, it's on page 18, table 13. And so anytime you do your inspection at an inspection station or Jiffy Lube or any other place that you get your inspection done, they have a chart and it's basically uh, brakes, lights, horns, mufflers, exhaust system, safety glass, license plate, windshield wiper, review, uh, rear view mirror, safety belts, tires, and fuel cap. Those are the basic things that your car needs and they need to be in working order. Um, also, when it comes to your tires, if you have a low tread on your tires, your tire, you may not pass inspection. So make sure that your, uh, your equipment is up to date. Your windshield wipers don't have any breaks or cracks on them. Um, your fuel cap is not leaking any emissions. Uh, your safety belts, of course, are for every seat provided in the vehicle. Um, and a rear view mirror if you have a uh, type of vehicle that allows you to see out your back window. And of course horns, but it, it, you can't be a horn that sounds like an exhaust whistle or anything that, that mimics a train. So um, there are certain things that, uh, that your car needs, but it has to be within the guidelines set by the state. So if you need to see a chapter, uh, if you need to see a, a copy of that table, look at table 13, which is right here. And this is exactly what the inspection person looks at when they, um, when they do your inspection. Question number 15, what is the purpose of an exhaust emission system? And it's real simple, it's to reduce pollution. Uh, number 16, describe the types of equipment that Texas state law specifically forbids on passenger cars driven within the state. Um, the answer to this is on page 19, and I went ahead and cut out that uh, little section on page 19 to show you exactly what it says, what's not allowed um, on your vehicle. So the following equipment is considered unsafe and is not allowed on your vehicle. 
Number one, a red light showing from the front or except on emergency vehicles. Um, a bell, siren, or exhaust whistle except on emergency vehicles. A muffler cutout. Anything extending more than three inches beyond the left side of uh, left side or six inches beyond the right side of the body, running board, or fenders of your car. Now pay attention to the um, the three inches. You are going to see that question on a permit test uh, for the road rules. So that's something you really want to focus on and keep in your notes. So that way, when you do take the test, it's going to be an easy uh, question for you to answer. Uh, flashing red lights on the front of the car, except for emergency vehicles, school buses, and, and church buses. And of course, any type of radar interference um, device that, that basically jams radar. But I'll go ahead and tell you this right now. This is the year 2019. Most police stations no longer use radar in order to measure your speed. They now use lasers. So uh, it's a lot more accurate than that of radar. So, um, and of course, uh, radar detectors are pretty much useless because... If you were to, um, even if you were to be able to detect radar, uh, most of these police stations have the frequencies that these companies use because you got to get a license by the FCC. So they'll just get onto a different frequency. So when your radar detector is going off, uh, it's actually picking up something other than a radar gun uh, from a police station or a police officer. It's usually picking up either somebody's microwave, someone's drone that they're flying in the air, or someone's remote control car. So um, yeah, you're you're definitely probably not gonna. It's not going to save you from getting a ticket, so best bet is just to go ahead and go the speed limit. Uh, question number 18. How should you react when a traffic officer tells you to do something that is ordinarily considered to be against the law? And it's real simple. You just follow the directions of the traffic officer. They tell you to stop, you stop. You, they tell you to go, you go. And I'll give you an example. If you're at a red light and it's also being controlled by a traffic officer and he's telling you to go, you go ahead and go. Don't, don't pay any attention to the signal light because the officer is the one in control. All right, question number 18. Once the brakes have been applied, about how many feet does a car which was going 70 miles per hour travel before it comes to a stop? And of course, the answer to this is on page 48, and the answer is 233 feet. So go ahead and look at that little diagram right there. It says going 70 miles per hour. That first number you see is the reaction time. That's how long it takes from the moment your eye sees danger for your brain to signal signal to your feet. And to, to go ahead and press the brake. Now, the moment you press the brake, that second number here, right there, is your actual brake distance that you use with your brakes. Now, you combine the two together, your approximate stopping distance would be 387 feet total. But for this question, it's actually asking you about your brakes and your brakes only. So you're, you should be able to stop a car going 70 miles per hour with your brakes uh, within 233 feet. Question 19. When is it necessary to stop before proceeding when you overtake a school bus loading or unloading children? Um, this is from chapter four, uh, answer on page 26. Uh, when red lights are flashing um, and the stop sign is out, go ahead and just stop. I mean, there's, there's different rules when it comes to uh, school buses, but it's pretty, it's pretty uh, standard. If you're behind a school bus and those lights are flashing red, uh, you definitely wanna stop. Uh, even on a four-way road and there's no median, everybody's got to stop. So um, look at uh, chapter four on page 26 for more details about what is necessary um, when around school buses. Question number 20, about how many feet will the average driver going 50 miles per hour travel from the moment he sees danger until he hits the brakes? This is from chapter eight. The answer is on page 48. And again, you see that little chart there. This is 110 feet. Now, this is talking about reaction time. So if you see that first number, 110 feet, that is your reaction distance. This is your braking distance. And of course, you combine the two for your approximate stopping distance. For this question, it's about reaction time. So the answer is 110 feet. Question 21, which within how many feet of a crosswalk may you park when parking near a corner? Uh, corners are usually intersections, um, but for the answer, you find the answer to this on page 45, uh, and the answer is within 20 feet of a crosswalk at an inter intersection or a corner. Question number 22, what is the state speed limit for automobiles in urban district? All right, so anytime you don't see a speed limit sign, there's still speed limits that you have to follow. So what is an urban district? An urban district is basically within city limits in suburban neighborhoods. So if you don't see a speed limit sign telling you exactly what speed that you, you're allowed to go, then by default, the, the fastest you can go on an on a urban street um, is 30 miles per hour. 
So uh, it, you'll find that on page 49 on table 24. Question number 23, does a posted speed limit of 50 miles, 55 miles per hour mean that you may drive 55 miles per hour on that highway under all conditions? This is from chapter eight and the answer is from, on page 48 and it reads, speed limit sign is for normal driving conditions. Normal and ideal, that means dry roads, sunny day, no adverse conditions. However, under adverse conditions such as rain, heavy traffic, limited visibility and reduced traction, you must go slower than the posted speed limit. Question number 24. You should never drive on the left half of the roadway when you are within how many feet of an intersection, bridge, or railroad crossing? Now, of course, this is talking about when passing another vehicle or driving on the left side in order to overtake another vehicle. Uh, this, is, this is found on page 41, and the answer is 100 feet. So if you're within 100 feet of a curve, 100 feet of a, of a hill, 100 feet of a tunnel, 100 feet of an intersection, um, these things uh, limit your visibility. 100 feet of a railroad track, these things limit your visibility, and therefore you should never try to pass or overtake another vehicle within these uh, hazards. Question number 25. What should you do if you discover you are in the wrong lane to make a turn as you enter an intersection? And that's real simple. The last thing you want to do is change lanes within an intersection. You can't, by law in a city, you cannot change lanes within 100 feet of an intersection. So uh, you just simply go straight. You, you continue along your way, find a detour, do a turnaround at a safe location, um, but do not change lanes within an intersection or within 100 feet of an intersection. So if you're in the wrong lane, no big deal. It's not the end of the world. Go ahead and try to find a, another safer approach and continue to go straight. <clears throat> Question number 26. When two cars meet at the intersection of a two-lane road with a four-lane road, which one must yield the right of way? And this is from chapter four. The answer is on page 23. A two lane road must yield to a four lane road. So anytime you have um, either a, a one way single road going to a multi lane road and the lesser road will always have to yield the right of way to the larger multi lane roads. Question number 27. If you are driving and hear a siren coming, what should you do? And I always tell my students the simple answer is yield. So simply yield depending on where your emergency vehicle is coming from. For example, if it's behind you, pull over to the right of the shoulder to let it pass. But another example would be if you're sitting at an intersection and your light turns green but you hear a siren coming and it's coming from the other direction, just simply stay where you are and let the ambulance pass through the intersection safely. So whatever condition you're in, go ahead and yield. Question number 28, what is the first thing that should be done when a car starts to skid? And this is, the, this is from chapter nine, and the answer is on page 52. Uh, you do not want to hit the brakes suddenly or hard, and you want to take your foot off the gas. That's the very first thing you do. And then of course, you want to turn in the direction of the skid. Now, it may seem confusing what it means, turn in the direction of the skid, because we're talking about the back end of your car, whatever direction that back end turns, that's where you're going to turn. So a much easier way to remember on where you should turn during a skid is just basically turn the wheel in the direction that you were trying to drive. So if you're driving straight down a street and your, and your car starts to skid and whatever direction your car is going, go ahead and turn the wheel in the direction of the road towards the road that you were trying to drive down to. And of course, take your foot off the gas and eventually you'll, you'll pull out of the skid and uh, you'll stay safe. Question number 29. At what time of the day should your headlights be turned on? Uh, this is from chapter 9. The answer is on page 50. And the rules for Texas is uh, you must use your headlights beginning 30 minutes after sunset, ending 30 minutes before sunrise, or any time when individuals or vehicles cannot see clearly for at least 1,000 feet. Now, in 12 states around the country, they actually require that your headlights be on all the time, no matter what time of day it is, if you're driving your vehicle, your headlights are on. So me personally, as a defensive driver, I drive with my headlights on during the day because it's a safety feature. It allows other cars to see you better. So even though Texas law hasn't really caught up to that yet, a good way for you to actually be safe out there on the roads is to go ahead and turn on your lights. Um, a lot of cars now have what they call daytime running lights. So this will actually help you keep your lights on and you won't forget to turn them off when you turn off the vehicle by having your daytime running lights uh, uh, set on your light switch. Question number 30. 
Under what conditions may your driver's license be suspended? This is from chapter one. Um, the answer is on page 12. Now they give you a laundry list of things that can actually be suspended for. So the answer would be a, li a license can be suspended for a number of different violations from continued reckless driving from the point system to mandatory suspensions for violations considered a felony or dangerous. For example, DWI, drug offenses, racing on public roads, overtaking a school bus. These are things at which you could actually have your license suspended. Question number 31, what is, a carbon, what is carbon monoxide and how may it be harmful to drivers? This is chapter 14, the answer is on page 71. Carbon monoxide is a deadly gas. When exposed to carbon monoxide, make sure to find fresh air and ventilation. Symptoms include dizziness and sleepiness. Overexposure leads to death. So one of the common things uh, when people do die of carbon monoxide um, from their vehicle, it's because they started the car inside the garage, but they didn't lift the garage door. And sitting inside their vehicle, they were overcome by carbon monoxide, fell asleep, and ultimately kills them. So you always want to make sure you have good ventilation wherever you're starting your vehicle. Um, and if you ever feel like there is carbon monoxide in the air, try to find fresh air and uh, get good, good ventilation. So that way you go ahead and avoid these type of... Uh, uh, scenario. So the same thing if you were to break down in, inside a tunnel, that could be a dangerous situation because there's a lot of cars in the tunnel and air can be uh, saturated with carbon monoxide. Question number 32. Describe what you should do if you have a blowout while driving. And this is from chapter 9. The answer is found on page 52. Uh, and it goes in this order. Do not hit the brakes suddenly or hard. Take your foot off the gas and brake gently and then steer straight ahead to stop. Question number 33. What should you do when driving down a steep grade in a car with a standard transmission? This is from chapter 9. Answers found on page 52. When driving down a steep hill, you can shift your car into a lower, ge lower gear to help slow your vehicle. Never coast in neutral or for cars with a standard transmission. Never coast with your foot on the clutch. Question number 34. What should you do if you damage an unattended vehicle? This is from chapter 11. Answer on page 63. First thing you want to do is locate the operator or owner of the unattended vehicle and give your name and address. Um, if you can't find the owner, you want to securely attach a written notice in a visible way to the unattended vehicle providing your name and address, uh, a statement of the circumstances of the collision. Question 35. When are crash reports required? This is also from Chapter 11. Answers found on page 62. If you are involved in a crash that is not investigated by law enforcement, officer and the crash has not resulted in injury or death of a person or damaged the property of a thousand dollars or more you must make a written report of the crash and file it with the texas department of transportation no later than the 10th day after the date of the crash the written report must be on a text.specific specific form which you can find on their website question number 36 if you're required to show proof of financial responsibility for the future how many years must such proof be kept up? Now, this is for scenarios in which your license was suspended. Some judges may require that you show proof of insurance for an X amount number of years. And of course, the standard is two years, which is found on page 22. Question number 37. What type of sign warns you to watch right and left for cross traffic? This is from chapter five. I went ahead and <clears throat> provided some signs uh, in which this is the scenario that you must watch out for cross traffic left and right. It's found, it's found on page 30 and 31. Uh, one of them is, of course, from the T intersection. As you approach the end of the road on a T intersection, you got to look out left and right, especially if you're turning left. And then, of course, as you approach a, uh, uh, a cross intersection. Uh, question number 38. Describe the emblem that identifies vehicles which travel at speeds of 25 miles per hour or less. This is from Chapter 5, Answers on page 40. And, of course, it looks like a triangle. Uh, it's orange and has a darker set of orange on the edges of the triangle. Um, I showed a picture of it here in the slide as well as what you normally would find it on is these tractors. Um, of course, you'll see these often anytime during the spring and summer and, and uh, early fall. You'll see these tractors out there mowing the grass and uh, they'll have these slow moving emblems along the side of the road as you see them mowing the grass. Question number 39. In which gear should you drive when going down a steep hill? This is from chapter nine. Now the previous question that talked about this was for, to, for a standard transmission, but for an automatic transmission, you just simply put it into a lower gear. So the gear that you drive in the most in the city, of course, is drive. And underneath it, you have gear, uh, gear three, gear two, and then of course the L gear, which is for low. So go ahead and throw it down into a low gear 
um, a lower gear depending on the uh, steepness of the hill in order to uh, put less pressure on your transmission because uh, putting too much pressure on your transmission eventually is going to cause the transmission to fail and uh, transmission replacement is one of the more expensive things in terms of car repairs that you could experience through the lifetime of your car so you definitely want to be watch out for that if you're in an area where there's a lot of hills luckily here in Houston it's pretty flat so you're really not going to see too much of that but uh, if you start moving up north or out into uh, west Texas or central Texas you'll definitely see a lot more hills where this is this will be necessary question number 40 what qualifications must one have to teach a beginner to drive and this is the answers on page one the person must be a licensed driver age 21 years of age with at least one year of driving experience must occupy the seat beside the driver and cannot be intoxicated, asleep, or engaging in any activity that prevents observation and response to the actions of the driver. So students, make sure your driver instructor is not asleep and is definitely not on their cell phone. They should be engaged in your driving and looking out for every scenario that can be possibly go wrong. They're there to help you and make sure that you're learning how to drive and stay safe. And same thing with your parents. If they're helping you to learn how to drive, Make sure they're not on their cell phones. Make sure they're not distracted by anything. And of course, if they're sleepy or intoxicated or the influence of marijuana or drugs, you definitely don't want to have them as your um, person teaching you how to drive for that drive time <clears throat> with a parent or friend. Um, you will have a 30-hour log that you have to keep track of. In that 30-hour log, you can use anybody, but they must meet these qualifications. So they have to be 21 years of age. They have to be a licensed driver and they have to have at least one year experience. So um, <clears throat> as you get that 30 hour log, just make sure that those people meet those qualifications so that it doesn't uh, uh, get thrown back at you when you try to get your license at the end of the program. Question number 41, if the person is under 18, when does his provisional license expire? Well, provisional license is given to those from 16 to 18. So the answer is in the question. When you turn 18 years of age, that's when your provisional license expires and you get a standard driver's license. And this course is found on page three. Question number 42. When parked parallel, your curbside wheels must be no more than how many inches from the curb? This is from chapter seven on page 47. Do not park more than 18 inches from the curb on the edge of the road. So when you take your driving test and you do your parallel parking, they're going to measure to make sure if it's, it's no more than 18 inches. If it's more than 18 inches, it's not a successful park. Question number 43, when following another car, what is a good distance at which you should follow behind? This is from chapter eight, answer on page 48. You should keep a safe distance between your car and the one in front of you. The faster you drive, the greater the distance you should keep from the car ahead of you. For speeds 30 miles per hour or less, the minimum time between your car and the one in front of you is two seconds with good road conditions. For speeds above 30 miles per hour, maintain a four second gap between cars during good road conditions. During periods of poor road conditions, allow more time. Using a four second following interval is the best practice for, for, getting, for beginning or less experienced drivers. So I always tell my students, I say, look, you know, if you're out there on regular roads, use four seconds. If you're out there on the freeway going, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles per hour, bump it up to six seconds. The more distance you have between you and the car in front of you, <clears throat> the less likely you are to, to be in an accident with that vehicle. So it's a good idea, especially as a beginning driver, <clears throat> not to stay too close because that's one of the leading causes of accidents is following too closely. So you definitely want to have a safe following distance. And of course, um, your teacher is going to teach you how to um, measure that distance of two seconds, four seconds, six seconds or greater. So that way you could always check yourself while you're driving. Question number 44, to what agency and within what time period must a change of address be reported for driver's license purposes? And the answer is on page 10. If you fail to let the DPS office know within 30 days of changing an address, um, you will get a penalty. You can get a ticket for that. And uh, people say, well, do I have to tell an officer? Because when you get pulled up by an officer, you're going to show him your license. And he's going to ask you a question. Is this address correct? Now, people usually say, well, I don't really have to answer that question. My Fifth Amendment right, self-incrimination, true. But when you drive a vehicle, you must, by law, give your name an accurate address. So when he asks you that question, is this address correct, you must tell him whether it's correct or not. And if it's not, you're definitely going to receive a ticket for that. So make sure anytime you change addresses, move to an apartment, a house, or vice versa, 
you know, make sure you go ahead and let the DPS office know. You could do it online um, or you could do it in person. So avoid that ticket and uh, get that uh, address changed on your license. Question number 45. What effects does the use of marijuana and amphetamine have on driving? Uh, this is from chapter 10, answer on page 58. Marijuana can affect concentration, judgment, and sensory and perceptual skills. Amphetamine makes a driver less coordinated, edgy, and is more likely to be involved in a car crash. So, uh, yeah, definitely don't want to do any type of drugs while driving, <laughs> let alone, and it's the same thing with alcohol. You don't want to be under any type of influence because this will definitely make it more difficult to drive. And of course, once you're, if you do get involved in an accident or you're pulled over by a police officer, um, the the punishment for that is uh, could be could be detrimental. Uh, what is the penalty for being convicted of driving while intoxicated? Question forty six. This is from chapter ten. Um, the answer is on page sixty one, and it's table thirty three. So these are the penalties for DWI and DUI. Uh, for alcohol and drugs for adults. Of course, the first offense is $2,000, um, 72 hours to 180 days in jail, uh, 90 days to 365 days suspension. Of course, as you see, as each offense goes higher and higher, the fines go up, the jail time goes up, and of course, your, your suspended license could be even longer, up to two years. All right, question number 47. What does a green arrow showing with a red light mean? This is from chapter five and the answer is on page 28. A green arrow displayed at the same time as a red light means that the driver can proceed carefully in the direction of the arrow after yielding the right of way to other vehicles and pedestrians. So this is one you're gonna, find, you're gonna see on your either road rules test or even on your road science test. Uh, they may show you this actual picture of a green arrow and a scenario and what you should do. So. That's uh, important information to know for your test. Question number 48. How should you react to a flashing red light? Uh, this, is on, this is bound on page uh, 28. Uh, stop completely before entering the crosswalk at intersection, then proceed when you can do so safely. Vehicles on the intersecting road may not have to stop. So for an easier answer, it would be treat it like a four-way stop sign and use the, the rules of right of way uh, for that uh, particular scenario of a flashing red light. Question number 49, which sign tells you to watch out for a train? This is from chapter five and the answer is on page 35. I went ahead and provided you um, of the three most common warnings for train tracks. And of course, anytime you see a circled uh, sign, that's specifically for railroad. And then uh, that lets you know you're within 100 feet of a railroad. And then of course, once you're at the actual railroad crossing, you're gonna see that, uh, uh, that X rail crossing sign and uh, not all rail crossings have this but most in cities have the arm with the flashing red lights letting you know that a train is coming and you must stop. Now remember anytime you're within, um, anytime you're stopped at a, at, a, at a train when a train's coming you cannot be any closer than 15 feet um, to that railroad track when you're stopped behind the tracks. Uh, question number 50 Describe the sign that warns you to slow down for a winding road, chapter five, page 30. I went ahead and provided you a picture of a winding road sign. Don't be, don't be confused with the double curve, um, but this is an actual winding road uh, hazard warning sign. So there's a winding road ahead, drive slowly and carefully and do not pass. Question number 51, what sign indicates that the road that you are on merges with another? This is from chapter five, the answer is on page 31. Um, the sign right here, which I've shown, um, it shows an arrow which kind of has a little tail attached to it and uh, basically means you're approaching a point where other traffic lanes come together with the one you're in. Watch for traffic from that direction. Question number 52. What kind of sign warns you that the highest safe speed for the curb ahead is 35 miles per hour from chapter 5? And the answer is on page 33. Um, you would see an advisory speed sign. Uh, that's what it looks like right there. The sign gives the highest speed which you can safely travel around a curve ahead. And uh, also another sign that lets you know that you definitely need to slow down, that you definitely want to be aware of is the exit speed limit off of freeways. Um, if an exit speed limit of 25 miles per hour, that means as you exit the, the freeway, you must slow down to that speed limit uh, in order to avoid a ticket as you merge onto the feeder road. Question number 53. Describe the sign that tells you to watch out for cross traffic ahead. Now again, we saw the sign before in an earlier question, but this is an actual cross traffic sign, hazard warning sign. 
Um, it's found on page 30. It means cross crossroad ahead, slow down, and watch for cra uh, cross traffic. Look carefully in all directions for traffic. Question number 54. What type of sign warns you that you should slow down for a sharp rise in the road ahead? Now this is a bump sign. This is found on page 32. This is what a bump sign looks like. Um, there's a sudden high place in the road ahead. Slow down in order to avoid losing control of your vehicle or avoid an uncomfortable jolt. Question number 55. Describe the type of sign that would let you know that you were on a short state highway in a city or urban area. Um, this is on page 35. Uh, like for instance, uh, Texas 235, Texas route marker sign tells you what road you're on while, tra while traveling on. Uh, plan your trip and know which road you want to take. Question number 56. What is the maximum number of inches you may lawfully allow an object to extend beyond the left fender of your car? And I have a highlighter right here. The answer would be three inches. No more than three inches beyond the left side of your body, running board, or fenders of your vehicle. Question number 57. Under what conditions must you always stop? This is from chapter 25, answer on page 28. Red light, flashing red light, stop sign, officer instructs you to stop when yielding to oncoming traffic on a left turn, and any and all pedestrians in a crosswalk or road. Question number 58. What should you do when coming onto a street from a private alley or driveway? So anytime you pull out of your own driveway, this question applies to you, and the answer is on page 23. When entering or crossing a road, street, or highway from a private road, alley, building, or driveway, you must stop prior to the sidewalk and yield the right of way to all approaching vehicles and pedestrians. Question number 59. If a child runs into the road 45 to 50 feet ahead of you, of your car, what is the highest speed from which you can stop with good brakes without hitting him? This is from chapter 8. Answer on page 48. 30 miles per hour uh, has a braking distance of 43 feet. So if you look at that chart from chapter 8, um, you'll see all these different speed limits. And of course, the only one with the actual braking ability of less than 40, 45 to 50 feet is uh, 30 miles per hour. That's about as fast as you can go and still stop safely without hitting that child. Question number 60. How close to a fire plug, fire plug is another name for fire hydrant, may a vehicle lawfully park? This is from chapter 7. The answer is on page 45. No closer than 15 feet. Question number 61. What does a posted speed limit of 55 mile, miles per hour mean? And the answer is on page 33. Uh, the sign tells you that the maximum speed in miles per hour you are permitted to travel. Sign also indicates the maximum speeds permitted on the road for day, time, and night time. But also know that this is for ideal or normal conditions. You know, nothing that, that would be considered adverse, right? Anything adverse is something that affects vision and traction. So if you're in a scenario where your vision or traction or both is affected, going 55 miles per hour definitely would not be a good thing. So speed limits are for only, only normal and ideal driving conditions. Question number 62. What is the maximum speed limit for passenger cars on a Texas highway numbered by the state or United States outside of an urban district? This is on chapter eight, answer on page 49. It's on that uh, chart. Now again, uh, 70 miles per hour. So if you don't see a speed limit, sign and you're outside of an urban area, you're in a rural area outside of town and you're on the freeway, like let's say I-10, and you don't see a speed limit sign, the max you can still go is 70 miles per hour. Now are there roads in Texas that have a speed limit greater than 70 miles per hour? Absolutely, but they must be posted. So don't assume that you can go faster than 70 and if you don't see a speed limit sign, just know that there's still restrictions on how fast you can go. Question number 63, under what circumstances should you never attempt to pass a car ahead of you? This is from chapter six. Answers on page 41. Um, and these are the different scenarios. Uh, pavement markings are signed prohibited driving on the left, no passing zones. There are two or more traffic lanes in each direction within a hundred feet or crossing of an intersection or a railroad crossing on a hill, a curve or any other place where vision is limited and within hundred feet of a bridge, um, viaduct or a tunnel. Under what condition, number 64, under what conditions are overtaking and passing to the right not permitted? This is from chapter six, the answer is on page 42, and it reads, when you are parked, when there are parked cars on the road, when there is no paved shoulder, when driving on a multi-lane road, and there is no blocked traffic. What that means is that if you have a two to three lane road and lanes are clear, 
um, it's it's not permitted to drive to the right. You should pass on the left if you want to pass other cars. Uh, question number 65. When a driver is waiting to make a left turn, what is the procedure he should take when the light turns green? Now, it's not saying a green arrow. It just simply says green. So this is chapter 5, and the answer is on page 28. You can turn left on a green light. However, you must yield the right of way to all traffic that is approaching from the opposite direction before turning. Question number 66. What precautions should a driver take at uncontrolled intersections? This is from chapter 4. Answer is on page 23. Now, you're going to see a scenario like this on your road knowledge test or your, your road rules test. Um, it's going to show you a, a diagram of an uncontrolled intersection where a car is stopped and you have an approaching car. Um, but the answer for this in the book states, when approaching this type of intersection, yield the right of way to any vehicle that has entered or is approaching the intersection on your right. If the road to your right is clear or if approaching vehicles are far enough from the intersection to make your crossing safe, you may proceed. Since there are not any traffic controls at this intersection, make sure there are no approaching vehicles from the left. You may legally have the right of way, but be sure the other driver yields to you before you proceed. So in this scenario, as a defensive driver, if you see a car coming from the left, you have to assume that they don't know to stop because they don't see any signals or signs. So in that scenario, you just simply let them pass. Be a safe driver. You may have the right of way, but at the same time, your life is more important than whether or not uh, you, you have legit legitimacy to that space. So... Um, definitely be on the safe side and let that car pass so if you see this type of question on a test um, the answer would be let the car go that would be the safe thing to do uh, question 67 what regulations should a bicycle rider observe this is from chapter 13 and the answer is on page 65 any person who operates a bicycle is subject to the same penalties for violating a traffic law as a person operating a motor vehicle all traffic convictions will be placed on the individual's driving record regardless if the convictions was for an offense committed on a bicycle or in a motor vehicle. So even as a parent, you have to understand if you allow your kids to drive, to ride their bike on the road, they need to know those basic road rules in order for them to be one safe while riding their bike on the road and two um, to avoid any type of trouble or legality when it comes to getting into accidents or our property, a damaged property or even injury. So um, just know that bicycles are just like a vehicle when out there on the road. Question number 68. Under what conditions should headlights be used? This is from chapter 9 and the answer is on page 50. Uh, 1. Driving in fog, heavy rain, sleet, snow, or dust. At night or in a tunnel or any time visibility is reduced. Question number 69. You should dim your lights when you are within how many feet of an approaching car? This is from chapter 9. Answer is on page 50 within 500 feet of an approaching car. And the reason why you want to do that, if you're in a rural area and you have your brights on and you're having a hard time seeing, but as you see an approaching vehicle, within 500 feet, you definitely want to throw it down to low beam so that way you're not blinding the other car as y'all pass each other. Question number 70. What type of lighting should cars use when parked on the highway at night? Chapter 9, answers on page 50. If you must park on an unlitted highway at night, leave your parking lights or low beam headlights on. Question number 71, which light should you use when you are driving in a fog? Answers uh, on page 50 from chapter 9, your low beam headlights. Question number 72, when, you are when are you required to show proof of financial responsibility from chapter 3? The answer is on page 21. Every owner or operator of a motor vehicle in Texas is required to furnish evidence of financial responsibility to a law enforcement officer upon request or any other person involved in a, cra in a crash. That is required by law. Now, there are other scenarios in which you must show proof of financial responsibility, which uh, includes getting your license at the DPS if you own a vehicle, um, renewing your uh, registration sticker, or having your car inspected. All of these are going to be times where they're going to require you to uh, show proof of insurance. Question number 73. When needed, how may one show proof of financial responsibility? This is from chapter 3. The answer is on page 21. There's basically two ways. You could have the physical copy of either a certificate or a policy provided by an insurance company or DPS office, or an image displayed on a wireless communication device. Now, you have to understand that you can't walk into the DPS office and renew your license or even get your license or take your road test 
and show it on an electronic device, you must show a physical copy in those scenarios. But any other time, like pulled over by a police officer, you can show a wireless communication device showing the, um, the insurance policy. Question number 74. What sign warns you that you must slow down? Uh, this is from chapter 5, answers on page 30. Many of the diamond-shaped signs require you to slow down for safety. For example, speed advisory sign must slow down to, to recommended speed limit, and wet roads uh, sign you must slow down below speed limit to navigate safely. So there's a lot of times where you're going to need to slow down, bump, dip, all those different hazard warning signs, going over a railroad track. Um, but ones that are, that are really, really important, uh, when the roads are wet, you've got to slow down, and... Um, uh, an advisory speed taking a curve. Question number 75, what circumstances may lead to a possible loss of your license? This is chapter one on page 12. There are a number of circumstances that could lead to a possible loss of your license, including anything deemed a felony under the motor vehicle laws, as well as getting six points on your driving record within a three-year period. Uh, any type of diagnosed medical condition can also cause a loss of your license, especially when your vision is affected to the point you can't pass the eye exam. So there are a lot of scenarios where you can lose your license. And uh, if you look at chapter one on page 12, you'll get a, a, a whole list of different things that can make you lose your license. But these are some of the, the main ones. Uh, question 76, in addition to mufflers, what new equipment is required on all cars manufactured in 1968 and after? Well, the Clean Air Act, of course, the 68, requires that all cars must have an exhaust system. And an exhaust system, of course, reduces pollution in the air. Question number 77, why are seat belts important? Well, <laughs> this should be a really easy question for you. It's from chapter 14, page 67. It's very obvious. Seat belts are one of the main reasons we survive car crashes. So, um, number one, safety belts keep you from being thrown from your car. Your chances of being killed are five times greater if you are thrown from your car. Uh, two, from hitting the dashboard too hard. And of course, whatever reason you want to have for not wearing a safety belt, you have to understand it's very dangerous and it's a violation of state law. Question number 78, what is meant by defensive driving? Chapter 14. Um, the answer is on page 67 and it reads, uh, stay alert and keep eyes moving to keep a track of what is happening at all times. Look for troubled spots developing all around. Have a plan of action and of course know that the law requires drivers to protect each other from their own mistakes. Um, when I'm a deep, as a simple simplification of defensive driver for me is basically looking out not only for yourself but for other drivers. So you're not forcing your rule of right of way on other drivers if you can see that they're struggling into merging into traffic and things like that. You want to avoid any type of accidents and of course loss of life, loss of life, property damage. So you want to get from point A to point B as safe as possible. So having the defensive driving mindset is going to get you there safer, allow you to live longer, and uh, keep you out of uh, a lot of uh, trouble when it comes to getting accidents out there on the road. Question number 79, what are the different classes of licenses and age requirements for each? Um, there, are different, there are four different classes of licenses, and they're all on page four. Uh, class A is for your big 18-wheelers, and you got to be 18 years old. Class B, I have a Class B license, allows me to drive a school bus, and you also have to be 18 years old. Class C, you can get a Class C under different circumstances at different ages. And of course, the youngest you can be is 15 years old with a hardship, 16 years old with a provisional license, and of course, when you turn 18, a standard license. And a Class M, you can, you can drive a moped with a Class M license at the age of 15, and you can drive a motorcycle at 16 with a Class M license. All right, question number 80. When is a bicyclist not required to ride to the right of the roadway? This is from chapter 13. The answer is on page 8. A person operating a bicycle who is moving slower than other traffic on the road shall ride near as possible to the right curb or edge of the road unless the person is overtaking and passing other vehicles proceeding in the same direction, the person is preparing for a left turn at an intersection or onto a private roadway, uh, there are unsafe conditions in the road such as fixed or moving objects, um, the person is operating a bicycle in an outside lane that is less than 14 feet in width and doesn't have a designated bicycle lane adjacent to that lane. Question number 81, when are bicyclists allowed to ride two abreast in a traffic lane? This is chapter 13, answers on page 65. Indi individuals riding two abreast on a, on a laned road must ride in a single lane and not impede the flow of traffic. So um, when they're on a laned road, they can drive two abreast. 
All right, uh, number 82. What are the three most common motorist caused car motorist excuse me motorist caused car bicycle crashes? This is from chapter nine. Answers on page 56. The most common car bicycle crashes caused by motorists are one, a motorist turn left in front of an oncoming bicycle traffic. Um, two, a motorist turns right across the path of the bicycle. Three, a motorist pulls away from a stop sign and fails to yield the right of way to a bicycle uh, in cross traffic. Question number 83, what are the penalties for minors, persons under the age 21, convicted of driving under the influence of alcohol? This is from chapter 10. The answer is on page 16. It's on table 31. So penalties for driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs by minors. First offense is a class C misdemeanor punishable by up to a fine of $500. So if you see that on the test, what's the fine amount? $500. That's the number you're going to have to know if you want to get that question right. Um, also, it could lead to community service, 20 to 40 hours, and attendance in an alcohol awareness course um, is required. If the minor is under 18, the parent may be required to also attend the course. Last question. Uh, question number 84. What are the penalties for minors, persons under the age of 21, convicted of non-driving alcohol-related offenses? So what is a, a non-driving alcohol-related offense? Um, this would be something like a minor in possession. So if you ever go to a high school party or a college party where alcohol is being served and you are a minor, you could actually be given a ticket for minor in possession, and that ticket can definitely lead to a suspension of your license. But the actual punishment is a Class C misdemeanor, uh, punishable by a fine up to $500, 8 to 12 hours of community service, mandatory attendance to alcohol awareness class, and um, your, your license may be suspended for up to 30 days. So uh, don't drink. It, it doesn't make you cool. It doesn't make life easier. Um, you know, follow the law. Got to be 21 years old. So, <clears throat> but this pretty much covers the 84 questions from your DPS handbook. Uh, if you missed any of them, feel free to go back in the video and uh, look at those questions. Go ahead and look at the page numbers too if you want to get further information, more detailed information. But this is pretty much all the questions from the DPS handbook. And a lot of these questions you're going to find on your actual knowledge test or your final exam for your uh, teen driver's ed course. So this is good to have, good to refer back to, and it makes things a lot easier um, when, uh, when having to learn from the DPS handbook. So I hope you really enjoyed this video. And uh, remember, subscribe and hit that like button, hit the bell notification for any new videos that may pop up in the future. And I really appreciate you watching All Ages Driving School. And I'm Mr. James. Y'all have a great day. And we want to thank you for using All Ages Driving School. We hope you found this information helpful and we wish you luck on your DPS exam. So follow the link to the exam and use the following password. Once you finish the exam, email your answers to the following email address. In the email provide a mailing address you would like your DE form to be mailed to or you can come by any of our locations to pick up your copy. Thank you for using All Ages Driving School Distant Learning Course. Please call or visit our website if you need additional help.